it's a blessing to be together in the house of the Lord. We uh, took a break last week, and then many of the men were together with us down south for our annual men's camp out. Special thanks to Daniel Wisby for bringing a very powerful, important message. We did small group breakouts and and some uh, great challenging things were talked about. And then uh, for Ben, who came and filled in here, I knew you were blessed, and I'm very grateful for that. I'd like you to turn in your copy of God's Word to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, if you would. It's um, very much in vogue, of course, today to pick on media outlets, and many times they bring it on themselves. I pointed out a number of times privately that if our president developed a cure for cancer, MSNBC and CNN would report that Trump puts thousands of research staff out of work. But sometimes when we read things, we uh, see that they're redundantly obvious, and no doubt drawing readers' attention to a story is difficult, and, and so writers do everything that they can. But once in a while, when you come across a headline that's so utterly unnecessary and redundant, it was written as if it were by Captain Obvious himself. Like these actual headlines uh, from a San Francisco newspaper, quote, parents keep kids home to protest school closure. From an Athens, Georgia paper, threat disrupts plans to meet about threats. From a Salt Lake City newspaper, quote, Utah Poison Control Center reminds everyone not to take poison. Thanks for the reminder. Appreciate that. From the Chicago news outlet, jobs remain the best insurance against unemployment. I kid you not, that's only news to a liberal. From New York Post, stores offering best bargains most popular. Thanks for the lesson in economics there, New York Post. This is from a California newspaper, most earthquake damage caused by shaking. As opposed to rattling and rolling, I, I'm not really sure what. From a Minnesota paper in the Ask Brook column, I kid you not, she answers, winter is the only time to go ice fishing. It could only have been better with the added phrase, when there's ice on the lake, just in case you were unsure. And this last one, although there were hundreds to choose from, from an Oklahoma City paper, Rally against apathy draws small crowd. I wasn't really sure I cared too much about that one. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter two, uh, chapter 9, verse 1. You'll see why we started that way here in just a minute. Verse 1, I'm, we're going to read the whole chapter because we are starting new with this chapter today. So as our habit, we'll read the Word of God, let it begin to do work at our own hearts. So verse 1. For it is superfluous for me to write to you about this ministry to the saints. Verse 2, for I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely, that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. Verse 3, but I've, spent, I've sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case, so that, as I was saying, you may be prepared Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. Verse 5, so I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead of you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift, so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Verse 6, now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Verse 7, each one must do just as he's purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Verse 9, As it's written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Verse 10, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 11, you will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. Verse 12, for the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Verse 13, because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God in your absence to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. Verse 14, while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. 
Verse 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Let's stop right there. Last time we were together, we finished up chapter 8. Last chapter, uh, this first, chapter 8, the last verse, verse 24. And we'll see in just a moment, it's an odd place to put a break. But look there, if you would, in chapter 8, verse 24. It says, therefore, openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love and our reason for boasting about you. And we saw that was our last principle as it dealt with the handling, the responsible handling of giving in the management of New Testament giving. We've talked about the attitudes that go into giving and what it, what it looks like in the heart and all that. Then we moved into this whole management of New Testament giving and the process of handling money. That, that uh, principle, uh, the process that we use and the accountability and uh, the oversight is a testimony of our love. Just like it shows our intent to meet need when we handle things well. When things are not handled well in parachurch ministries or in church ministries, it makes it very obvious that your intent was not to meet a need, but your intent was to do something completely different. So we saw that our love is measured by our generosity. And, and Paul says to the church, he says, we have put in place all the safeguards that we need. And, and we have given you all the instruction that you're going to need in order to take up this offering and what you need to know. And, and you know the attitude that you have to have. And you know the faithfulness that needs to be there. And, and you've seen all that example. So then he says, just give and show your love. And, you know, Paul says we can talk about it all we want to, and we can say that we love, but it's really meaningless if we don't follow through and put it on display because love acts by giving. And it's also, we're going to see in this whole new section, this is a pathway of blessing. That's a way to walk that we know is approved by God and is pleasing to him. And so this is a way that he's able to bless you back. In Ephesians chapter five, he's talking basically about many of the same things. And he says this very important. He says, in verse one, he says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Well, what does that look like? What's it mean to be an imitator of God? And I think you know where we're going here. Uh, verse two says, um, walk in love. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. And then in light of all that, he goes through a little section there where he tells his readers that, you know, make sure there's no greediness, there's no materialism and other uh, works of darkness that shouldn't be named among believers but their life should be lived in such a way, verse 10, trying to learn what's pleasing to the Lord. That's marvelous, isn't it? That's really what our life is supposed to be summed up was as a believer. We're trying to learn what's pleasing to the Lord instead of trying to be as close to the world as we can or doing what the world says or, or kind of living like we've always lived, no matter how old we are. Trying to learn what's pleasing to the Lord is something that never goes out of style. It's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. And we're supposed to model and be imitators of God, because, and that's to walk in love and then learn what's pleasing to the Lord. And in this particular topic that we're looking at here, we know precisely what that is, and so do they. What's pleasing to the Lord, to give in, this, in such a way that uh, it, it models love and faithfulness and sacrifice. And so when we begin in 2 Corinthians 10, chapter 9, verse 1, and we read, for it's superfluous for me to write to you, that's why we started with all those superfluous types of headlines, it's, it's obvious that you already know what you're supposed to do. It's superfluous for me to write this to you about the ministry to the saints, for I know that you're ready. And this is an unlikely place for a chapter break because the thought flows uninterrupted from verse 24 right into this verse. Verse 24 says, Show them the proof of your love and our reason for boasting in you, for I know it's superfluous of me to write to you about this ministry to the saints. So you can see this is the same breath. And I know why the writers broke it up. They wanted to make it so it's memorizable and you can find a place in the scripture. This seems to interrupt a continuing thought, so we'll just continue the thought. It's pretty patently obvious and so redundantly obvious, as a matter of fact, that this is what love looks like. You don't need me to tell you about that. And if you remember, Paul had already taught them about love as a verb in 1 Corinthians 13. And when we know, not just the Corinthian church then, when we know that when the love of God has been distributed to your heart and that you have felt of his generosity and have experienced his generosity to you, and when you've experienced the love of the Spirit, then it will be distributed to others through you. See, That's all already expected. Expect us for us to respond in, in the way that we've been dealt with by the Lord. That's what it means to be imitators of God. And so after giving to the church all the ways that love's a verb in 1 Corinthians 13, how it meets needs and it bears all things and everything else, the Holy Spirit carries Paul along to say then, uh, but now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 1, it's superfluous of me to write to you about this ministry to the saints, for I know you already know this, and I know your desire to show your love generously. So we have to, we don't really need to talk about it again. And what does that mean? Well, Paul, you know, I've taught you about this by love and action. We show that our salvation claim is certain. Beloved, that's how that works. Love and action shows your salvation claim is certain. 
If you're unsure about whether you're really saved, then look at your life and see how you respond to other people. Are you responding in love constantly? Is it your first reaction to respond generously and sacrificially and faithfully to other people? Because love is a trademark of all true believers, and nothing reveals that love more clearly than giving generously, which is our topic of these two chapters. And, and this is the pathway to blessing. Obedience in this area is always a pathway to blessing from the Lord, and this is no different from any of those other things. Now look at verse 2. For he says, I know your readiness, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians. And so principle number one on this pathway of blessing, New Testament giving is exemplary. So when you're giving in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, it's exemplary. Done right, it's commendable. It's not marginal. It's like you barely doing the bare minimum, that kind of thing. See how little you can get by with doing, right? And then always promising God, I'll do better next time and really never following through. That's not single-mindedness and not pleasing to the Lord. New Testament giving done right is exemplary. That's why Paul says, you know, it's the purpose of me to write to this about the ministry of the saints. I know your readiness and I boast to the Macedonians about that. It's exemplary. The type of giving and hard attitude uh, is able to be duplicated amongst other people as they watch. It's done right, it's commendable, and the Lord will commend you for it and bless you. And if someone asks me, you know, and they do often, sometimes in, in meetings and stuff, you know, if you could have your way in the church, how would you like to see giving done in the church? And I'll just give you what we're going to see today because this is what I always say. Give so there's no shortfall. Whatever our need is, it's going to be met. And not only that, give more than we need so that we can expand ministry. And so not just meet projected needs, not just figure out, okay, how can we cover all of those basic points, but go beyond those projected needs and allow the church to expand and do other things, see? And catch this, the giving would be generous enough that we would become a standard for the example of generous giving. Now, it may not be, beloved, get this, it may not be the most amount given, okay? And if you remember when Jesus was watching the temple, it wasn't the most amount given that he mentioned, was it? It was the faithfulness of the widow giving everything that she had. And so we're not talking about that. We're not saying, okay, well, as we stack up churches, how much, how much will it be? We're just talking about it's an example of what generous giving looks like, see? A giving by which all church giving is measured. That's what I'd like to see church giving look like at Berean. And if that sounds, and catch this, if that sounds far-fetched, remember what we have here that we're studying is that very thing, church is not that different from our own, who are the standard of generous giving in the New Testament and became the model for everybody to follow. So it's not like we're asking for something special. We're a New Testament church, right? We can be just like that, can't we? Now look at the rest of verse 2. We'll get to our next principle. Verse 2 says, For I know your readiness, it's obvious that you're ready to love, of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year, and your zeal has stirred up most of them. So Achaia, the church close to Corinth, was stirred up by Corinth, and the Macedonian churches were stirred up by Corinth. So obviously, uh, on the pathway to blessing, New Testament giving is contagious. And that's kind of how that works, see? Paul says to the Corinthians, you were the first to start. And we know why they stopped, because Paul was undermined by criticizers, but they were the first to want to love this Jerusalem church in this way, and their zeal stirred up some other churches. And so they became the example in heart attitude for everybody else, see? So the Corinthians were blessed, and their zeal to do it stirred up the Macedonians and the Achaeans, and they were blessed. And their example marked this to all the other churches in the first century, and down through the ages as it's been preached over and over again, all the way down to Berean right now, see, gave and continues to give opportunities to be exemplary and stir up contagious love of generosity, see? That's the whole point that the scripture is here. And I think that's amazing, don't you? That this is the example, it's a church very similar to other churches, even in the modern times, that at that point was the example to New Testament churches and all through the ages has been the example and continues to be the example. See, And this is what the Corinthian church inspired in 2 Corinthians 8, 3 and 4, right? I testify the according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, remember? begging us with much urging for the favor of participation and support of the saints. In other words, they came and asked Paul. They weren't even directed by Paul to do it. They came and asked Paul if they could. He probably wouldn't have asked them. Remember, we looked at that because of their difficult situation. They asked to be involved, and they were excited because of what the Corinthian church had modeled. And so they gave like that, Paul says, because of your example as he talks to this Corinthian church. And the Corinthian church's initial generous giving 
And their zeal was the reason the Macedonians were able to make a further example of God's grace at work. And I think that's pretty cool. And if you think about it, it, just think about it this way, it had to be an individual zeal, right? That spread and resulted in a corporate body zeal, right? I mean, it wasn't, and we, we, we see that clearly in Macedonia, there was no end of the service announcement that said in Macedonia, okay, now that we're done with the, the ministry of, of the word, we're all now going to be excited and generous with our money. Start. Does that work? I can tell you after 28 years of ministry, that does not work, okay? If that's the only way you're going to generate a net, uh, an offering, that's not going to work, okay? Because you have to think through that, right? And we've gone through all that process of what that looks like. The faithfulness of examining what's coming in and a single-mindedness to be uh, a generous, faithful, sacrificial giver. And when that all become, it comes in line and you begin to see that, you know, it's not just grace giving. It's not just willy-nilly, whatever you want to do, but there's accountability. And so I'm going to be faithful about this. And I know what comes in and I know what goes out and I know the cho choices that I've made. And God knows that too, see. And God knows all of those things. And so I'm getting my life in order. And so this is individual people who begin to do this. And then that becomes contagious. It works that way always in the church. When people are generous and people see that reported, they're like, man, people are being really generous. We, we should be generous too. We've not been generous like we should. See, and that's kind of exactly how that works. See? And so it's an individual zeal, not a general announcement that turned into a corporate body zeal. Individual started and it spread. And Paul now wants the Corinthians to continue that example. See, that they started. He wants them to continue in the right direction. And unfortunately, though, the Macedonians didn't require an end of the service announcement, but the Corinthians did. They had an end of service announcement. Look at verse 3. This is for them. Paul says to this Corinthian church, But I've sent the brethren in order that our boasting about you may not be made empty in this case. So what's he shading? I don't want them to show up and that you've been waffling around and then there's nothing there for them to take up. And that's a sad deal, isn't it? That they decided that uh, partway through being faithful, they weren't going to be faithful anymore and waffled back and forth and were divisive. And so he says this, so that as I was saying, you may be prepared, verse 4, otherwise, if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. So Paul says, you know, he's going to send this group, the financial steering committee we looked at two weeks ago. Uh, that's that's uh, Paul and Titus and two unnamed leaders in the church. They're going to go. And then Paul now says, I may be bringing some Macedonians with me, along with the group. And now I'd like you to hold your finger right here and just briefly look to Acts chapter 20. Will you? And we're going to see... Uh, a section here that's going to tell you what that looked like, perhaps, and maybe some of the people who came along with Paul. And I think this, when you put names to, to just general references, I think it helps the Bible to come alive. And so that's why we do this. So the contents here is Paul's in Ephesus, and a craftsman by the name of Demetrius has stirred up a riot in the city because Paul was teaching that gods made by hands were not gods at all. Imagine that. So Paul gives this truth, and then the riot stirs up. People don't want to hear it. So, you know, cultures are not that much different, are they? I mean, they don't want to hear a message, and so they don't like it, so they, they go and burn and break everything. But, and, and this is because Demetrius was a silversmith, and he made silver shrines to the goddess Diana, and he was upset because Paul says, hey, gods made by hands aren't gods at all, so, you know, business was suffering. So he stirs up a riot, and the whole thing's a mess. And then verse 1 says, After the uproar had ceased... Paul sent for the disciples, see where we are, and when he had exhorted them and taken his leave of them, he left to go to Macedonia. So there's Macedonia again, back in the picture, verse 2. And when he'd gone through those districts and had given them much exhortation, he came to Greece. Verse 3, and there he spent three months, and when a plot was formed against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia, verse 4. And he was accompanied by, now mark this, Sopater of Berea, the son of Purus, by Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy, and Tychicus, and Trophimus of Asia. So now we read, you know, that so that we can know that these might be some of the guys Paul's referring to in 2 Corinthians 9 4. And he says, listen, besides the steering committee, there may be some other people that are going to come along from these churches in Macedonia who heard about your giving, got excited about it, and followed through in a very sacrificial, selfless, and generous manner. So then he says in verse 4, Otherwise, if any Macedonians, perhaps some of these guys, come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to speak of you, will be put to shame by this confidence. And so Paul says, you know, when these guys show up with me and the rest of the group there that you know is coming and you don't follow through, that could be very embarrassing for them 
and for you since you inspired them to begin with. And that makes sense, doesn't it? You, you stirred them up and then you waffled away and then these guys followed through and now they're going to come and, and you're kind of the hero in this story. We want to make sure you remain the hero in the story that your generosity and your desire to follow through is followed through with an actual giving. And, and this letter is then the end of service announcement for the Corinthians. Ever the rebellious, hard to convince, contentious church, always doubting their leaders. And so he comes to and just says, listen, this is probably be a good idea that you go ahead and follow through. And, and they've, they've made some forward progress. And we saw that in 2 Corinthians 7, didn't we? How they repented. And, and when Titus came, he was encouraged because they had repented of, of their divisions and all that. And we saw that the Holy Spirit carries Paul along for a stronger urging. And, and that's this next principle on the pathway of blessing. Principle number three, on the pathway of blessing, when we give generously and faithfully and sacrificially and follow through with our commitments, and that's what Paul's calling the Corinthian church to do, we avoid shame and we avoid a negative testimony. And that's really just the hard words he has to say to them. You don't want this. This is going to be a mess. You know, Paul said, I, I have said you have a great love for the ministry. I've told these people this. And I have told them that I have confidence in you, which is very appropriate for Paul. He's an elder and he's, he believes the church will do the right thing. And I've told them I believe in you and, and you've been a super great example in the past. So continue to be one now and we're going to avoid the awkward circumstances if you don't, see? And, and in the modern vernacular, you want to move that into a New Testament era. You want to move that into the modern church. When you do that as a modern church, you avoid the mid-year budget meeting to scale everything back. That's hard to hear, isn't it? But that's precisely how that works out, see? And, you know, the world, the world watches the church. And what kind of job does it do supporting the ministries it takes on? How faithful is it? How does it maintain its buildings? How does it maintain its grounds? You know, the job we do, the job we should be able to do, because of faithful giving should be excellent. See, we shouldn't just make excuses and do a second rate job because we're just a church, you know, and nobody expects much of us. We should do a first rate job. Why? An excellent job because it's part of our testimony and we serve the King of Kings. And that, that beloved, that's not unusual. That meshes very well with how we know the job we're supposed to do in ministry is supposed to look like, right? We've seen that over and over again. When you do a ministry, what's it supposed to look like? Diligent, fervent, faithful. We've seen that over and over and over again. So why is it any different with the ministry that we have of generous giving? It isn't. See. All ministry is supposed to be like that and giving is no exception. And, and then we avoid the awkward and we avoid the embarrassing. See. Now look at verse 5. So I thought it necessary, he says, to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift. So when they first heard about it, they were excited. They promised a large gift. We're in this big time. We're invested. That's what the Corinthian church said. We're going to make sure their needs are overabundantly met. We're going to take care of everything. Or this is a good thing. We know we should do it. You know, they're all invested in it. They were moved to do that. So he says, I'm going to arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift. In other words, you're going to follow through and do precisely what you said you were going to do. And that's principle four in the pathway of blessing. Faithful, generous, giving church can be a credible model for other churches to follow, which is why I said, it, when people ask me, what should the church giving look like? It should be a credible model for other churches to follow. There's no reason why it can't be. See? And along with the desire for discipleship, that can be a model too, right? A church can be very faithful disciplers, and that can be a great model to the community. They can say, wow, they really, they really take care of people who come to faith. They bring them along, help them grow in the Word, understand what the Word says, and put it to work. You know, at, you know, a desire to read the Word. People who are of a church who can be an example of being in the Word. That church knows what the Word of God says and applies it to their life. It's not a mile wide and inch deep like much, most churches are. It's deep. And it has, it has, it has uh, substance. And they know what the Word of God says. It's put to work every day. That can be a model, too. An increased desire to share the gospel. A church can be exemplary in, in evangelism. A church can be well known. Wow, that's a church that really shares the gospel. Those guys and girls, they go out and they sh faithfully share the gospel. They've taken the Great Commission and it's theirs. They know that what they're supposed to do. See? So our credibility is always at stake. And that's precisely what Paul's saying to the Corinthian church. Your credibility is at stake right here. Step up and do what you said you were going to do. A generous giving, which works its way out in practical ministry, is one of the ways we ensure our credibility and bring in glory to Christ. See? And Paul is, is sending people on ahead of him for the church's accountability. And they're going to come, 
And they're going to prompt a desire for the Corinthian church to have credibility and do what they said they were going to do. So Paul continues, and he says in verse 5, he says, So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift, now mark this, and not affected by covetousness. And that's a very, very sobering remark. So it was one or the other. It's either you're following through generously, sacrificially, bountifully, doing what you said you were going to do, or your giving is affected by covetousness. And that's principle five on the pathway to blessing. New Testament giving, when you do it like we see it here, you've overcome, uh, it's, you've prevailed over sin. You prevailed over sin. And what's he mean by that? Well, the giving was promised of their own free will, right? The Corinthians decided to be involved. They committed to do it. They weren't under any compulsion to make that promise to give. Now that they've promised a bountiful gift, Paul's holding them accountable to it, right? But they weren't, there was no obligation to do that. It was based on whatever their increase was. So it didn't matter if they had a big, a big income or a small income. It was faithful. And Paul's sending these brothers before him so there would be strict accountability in the handling of the money. So it's not that there'd be any question of handing over this big offering and now what's going to happen to it. They know what's going to happen to it. It's going to get right where it's supposed to go. And obviously, to help by their presence there, to encourage people to follow through for the right reasons because of love and because of obedience and trust and generosity and sacrifice and faithfulness. Let's see. And to help them avoid this wrong heart attitude of covetousness. Pleoexion, a desire to have more. A very simple, a very hard word. Pleon is more, and echo is to have. Always used in a bad sense in the New Testament. Jesus uses it in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. He tells his disciples, Beware and be on your guard against every form. Here's our word of greed. It's used, it's translated greed many times. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist in his possessions. They don't consist in what you have. Your life is not made up of what you have, period, whether it's a lot or a little. So your, your identity is not in whether you have a huge income and a great portfolio or a very small income and hardly anything. Your identity is in Christ. So he said, listen, and your, your security is in Christ. So he just tells his disciples, be on your guard against every form of greed. And Paul says to the church, listen, we want that to be a bountiful gift. And if it's not, it's affected by covetousness. That's not a good deal. And so we can look at it this way. You know, Paul's saying in the ministry, if the ministry that you see is God's work, and we know that it is, and, and it agrees with his will, which it does, it's meeting immediate need in the Jerusalem church. And so if it's being done in a way that pleases God, which it is, they've set up all the, the accountability and the oversight so that it will be pleased God in that, in that way, then it is deserving of participation. That's really the, the logical thought process there. See, And if they have it to give, and we understand that everyone does in a greater or lesser amount, right? Because everybody has some kind of income. And so in proportion, you have it to give. Then, here it is, if they don't give, mark this, it's a sin issue. That's the issue. Because the one sin that affects giving most is covetousness, isn't it? It's greed. Wanting to have more, or keep more, or get more most of the time at somebody else's expense. That's so why I, I, I tell you all the time, it's, it's best when, you, when you've made a single-mindedness and you desire to give and you want it to be sacrificial and you want it to be faithful and you want it to be generous, then it's best just to do it when you have your increase. Do it right then. Just, you've made a decision, you've thought through all the facts, you know what your overhead is, you know what you can do. God knows all your, your resources and he knows all your choices, okay? So it's not a secret to him. You're just taking some time to make sure you're being honest about it. And once you've come to that point, see, then you have made that decision and it's just best to just do it right up front. Why? Because if you wait, what happens? There's always something else that comes up that you kind of like to have. And if you didn't do what you thought you were going to do in giving, you could probably do it because that's what it means to be sacrificial. It cuts into something you'd rather have, see? And so when you do it up front, then there's not any covetousness, is it? You, you remove the ground underneath the opportunity for covetousness at that point. And you just, you're single-minded to say, like, we're doing this and you know, the Lord knows what's going to happen the rest of this month. He knows what's going to happen the next, over the next pay period. And I'm not worried because my security's in him. It never was in me to begin with. And so we've made this decision. We've thought through it carefully. We know what we can do. And that's what we're going to do. And then you just do it, see? 
And then you don't have to struggle with covetousness. And the whole idea, I think, is, is you know, Paul was to make sure this whole covetous thing is absent from the Corinthian church. Just like Jesus said to his disciples, make sure there's, there's nothing in your life that even par- uh, partially resembles this. And so just a few illustrations, I think, to help, again, help us understand the whole foundation here. Psalm chapter 10, verse 3 says, The wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and uh, here's our word, greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. I'm going to put all this together here in just a minute. But I just want you to see how these words are used and how awful that is and how repelling it is for a believer to be in amongst that. Because we think it's not a big deal. We think, you know, well, I know I won't give what I said I was going to give this time, but I'll do I'll catch up next time, you know. And that's an, that's an ugly place to be once you've determined what it is that you should be doing. And, and that passage right there harkens back to our look at answering the question in your own life of whether you love money or not. And then Mark chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus is teaching. He says, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, the fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, verse 22, R word, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, verse 23, all these things proceed from within and defile the man. So, you know, you may say, well, I mean, there was a lot of need that month, and so that's why I didn't give what I was going to give. No, you didn't get what you were going to give. That came out of your heart. That was a desire to keep what you said you were going to give. Don't, don't say that some outside influence that comes out from the inside of the person, and you have to deal with that issue. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, as Paul is giving instructions, he says, don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? So who are the unrighteous, Paul? Well, don't be deceived. If these are part of your life, this is a pattern of your life, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, homosexual, that's the pattern of your life. You've chosen that life, and you're going to do it no matter what the Lord says about it. Nor thieves, nor, here's our word, covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty clear. So if your life is made up of those things, you're not in the kingdom. Verse 11, such were some of you, Paul says, you used to be this way, but you're not that way anymore. You used to be covetous, but you're not that way anymore. You used to be drunkards, revilers, perhaps homosexuals, effeminate, idolaters, adulterers, fornicators, swindlers. You could have been that, but you aren't that way. You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. See? So again, not a great, not great company. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3, we just read part of that earlier. But immorality or any impurity, or here's our word, greed, must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Verse 4, and there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving a thanks. What's supposed to be part of the Christian life? Is it supposed to be greed? No. Impurity? No. Immorality? No. Um, no coarse jesting. Uh, kind of off-color types of jokes. Silly talk. That's not fitting. For this you know with certainty in other words, this common knowledge to you should be, he says, that no immoral or impure person, our word, covetous man, who is an idolater. So in other words, when you, when you can't commit to doing what you're going to you say you're going to do here as it deals with giving, because Paul uses this word, and you keep pulling it back, you're an idolater. What are you, what are you idolizing? What are you placing ahead of the Lord? Well, money. It's not hard to figure out, right? has nobody who does that as a habit has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And that, that's the whole thing, see? That's the whole, uh, the whole idea of Mark 7 when, when Jesus said, you know, depart from me, I didn't know you, right? Well, we didn't we do all kinds of, and we told the men this, the men's, didn't we do all kinds of churchy things, you know? Didn't we, didn't we uh, you know, come to church? Didn't we teach Sunday school? Didn't we, you know, uh, all of that stuff? And the Lord says, um, I, don't, I don't know you. You work lawlessness. What's that mean? It just means your pattern of your life was these things. See, you might have done the church things, but the pattern of your life was the other things, and that just that just made it clear that you didn't ever belong to him. See, so that's a that's a terrible thing to think about, but it is very clear. Paul says, "You know this common knowledge: no one moral person, no no covetous man who's an adulterer has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God." So you, you want to be sure where you are. You know, you're struggling with this besetting sin. You want to make sure you're actually in the faith. Second Peter two fourteen having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, speaking of uns, uh, unredeemed, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained, here's our word, in greed. That's not hard, right? I mean, our whole culture has a heart trained in greed, doesn't it? You always have to watch yourself, right? When you go to the mechanic, you have to watch yourself. Yeah, because they heart trained in greed, right? When you go to the grocery store, you got to make sure you get the right change. Why? Why? People have a heart trained in greed. Right, you go to you try to invest, and you're investing with the wrong company. Uh, you're going to be beat to death with fees and 
and all kinds of uh, surcharge. Why? Because people have a heart. They have a heart that is is uh, trained in greed. But our hearts should not be trained in greed, right? Because these are the character traits of unbelievers. First Timothy chapter six, well known passage. We've looked at it numerous times, but. It, Again, it, it resonates. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. Not money itself. See, my son came home and told me the other day, somebody at school, one of his teachers said, you know, money, money is evil. Okay, um, maybe you shouldn't teach that in your class. Maybe you should just focus on math or chemistry, okay? Because when you say that to kids, that really is frustrating for them, right? Because you live in a world and that's how we get through. So that means if you are successful and you make a lot of money, then you must be wicked. And that can't be the case, can it? If the Lord promised his people when they moved in the promised land that everything they would have would abound, and then you're going to be in sinfulness because you have more than you need. I mean, the whole thing gets, you know, it runs contrary to what the Bible teaches. And so we cleared that up. We looked at the passage. No, that's not what it says, right? You don't have to put up your hand and correct the teacher. Don't do that because that's not good either, okay? Teachers don't like that. But here's the deal. You know, when a 15-year-old knows more about the Bible than you do, and you're teaching in a classroom, you know, makes dad want to call. For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, right? And we know that we're not supposed to love money, right? Because the Lord provides our, everything that we have. We, we're, we're secure in Him. And yes, you know, money is the way we conduct our business, but we know that everything belongs to Him, and everything we have is, is a stewardship. So if He gives us more than we need, that's, that's just a stewardship, and that's the whole idea here, Right? The love of money is the root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it, that's, that's the implied covetousness, you're longing for money, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves through with many griefs. Verse 11, but flee from these things, you man of God, pursue righteousness, godless, godlessness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So instead of those things, pursue these things. And of course, on in, the, in that passage, we see, you know, let those who are rich in this present world be rich in good deeds and ready to share so they can lay up for a life that's truly life for themselves in the future. And so, you know, it deals with all of those possibilities, and that's an important thing to, to uh, parse out. So obviously, the company of greedy or covetous is company we want to avoid. And so again, as you make this transition from uh, to evaluate your giving biblically, from moving away from a consumer mentality and just consuming it on yourself, and you want to bring your, you bring your uh, finances in line with what the Bible says, how we should manage them, so he can bless those finances, see, um, then as you're doing that, then as you look at the, at, at the opportunity for ministry, and if the ministry is God's work and it agrees with his will, and if it's being done in a way that he has prescribed, then Paul says it's deserving of giving and they should give. And if they have it to give and they don't give, then Psalm 10, 3, they curse and spurn God because what? They're greedy. And, and they show depravities at work, Mark chapter 7. And, and, and if that lifestyle is a choice of greed or covetousness, they're probably not saved, 1 Corinthians 6, see? See, so that's how hard it is to hear that. But Paul just, he says, it's either this, it's either you're generous, you're going to follow through, you're going to do what you're supposed to do, or there's covetousness at work, and you don't want that there, see? So, so um, they have it to give, they don't give, then their money has become an idol, Ephesians 5. A and they should be warned by actions of, of others who have wandered away from the faith in the same way and pierced themselves through with many griefs, 1 Timothy 6.10, and... and you know, if that's how they are, they have a heart trained in greed, 2 Peter 2, 14. And beloved, those are hard things to hear, and they're hard things to say. This is what Paul's telling the church. So there has to be accountability there for us. Ecclesiastes 5, 10, he who loves money, that's, that's covetous, will not be satisfied with money. No, he loves abundance with its income. We looked at that before, translated, he's never thankful, he never has enough, he never gives any of it away, it's never going to satisfy. Even though they're keeping it, it's not going to satisfy them, right? As one who, who gives away more than and perhaps he could, and, and yet is always in abundance, and there's some that keep what they should give away, and, and yet are always uh, in poverty. You know, this is, this is the same thing we see over and over again. You can't escape the laws of God, which, which deal with believers, and this is how he wants us to manage what we have, and he's given us everything we have anyway, so it shouldn't be hard for us to use it and see it as a stewardship and then deal with it appropriately. And it's good to get that in your mind early, and you know, when you're teaching your children, as they grow into uh, however you manage it, if you do allowances or you do, you know, uh, piecework or you do a job, you make money, whatever, you, you should right away begin to to help your kids see that those resources come from the Lord and that they're loaned to them. And even with a small amount, they they should be separating some out that they want to give. And it should be a free will type of giving. You know, you'll you'll have your children, you know, when they're little, you know, like say they they uh, stack wood for you, they made 10 bucks. And then you'll say, okay, we're, we're going to we're gonna save something. So I want you to save 10%. So how much is that? And you'll do the math. And then they're like, so what do you want to give to God? Seven. 
That's what they'll say. I want to give them seven. Is that a bad thing? Of course it isn't a bad thing. Is generosity a bad thing? Do we get generosity from the Lord every day, all day, all the time? We sure do. More than we ever deserved, right? We, I could say, and you could stand up and say, I received more than I've ever even possibly imagined I deserved, right? So if they want to be generous and they don't have much overhead, what's the problem with that? There's no problem with that, is there? Does the Lord return back on them in proportion to what they give? Does it work when you're four as the same as it works when you're 40? Of course it does. As you just encourage that generosity and just say, that is marvelous that you want to do that. And the Lord replays that. And they find that out. And of course, as a parent, you pay a part in that, don't you? You play, you play a part in, in them seeing the blessing that comes, see? Because that's how the Lord's going to deal with them as adults. So it's good to learn it early. And so I'm sure when, you know, Paul says, you know, be ready for the abundant giving and, and don't let there be any covetousness. I mean, sure, I'm sure they read that letter and they're thinking, you know, wow, why? covetous people don't find themselves in very good company. You know, Genesis 3, 1, 1 through 6, that's Eve's attitude in the garden. In fact, that's the exact word it uses. Jacob's attitude with Isaac and the blessing in Genesis 27. Achan's attitude in Joshua chapter 7. He saw it, he saw the, he saw the golden fabric and he saw the gold and he desired it, right? You know, David's attitude with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel 11, yikes. Ahab's attitude with the vineyard, remember? He wanted the vineyard next to the castle and went and killed the guy who owned it so he could have it. 1 Kings 21, that's Elisha's servant Gehazi. Remember when Naaman comes and offers a whole bunch of stuff, clothes and everything, and then Gehazi, or, uh, Elisha says, no, go on, we don't need any of your gifts. You know, we'll just heal you. We don't need anything from you. And then Gehazi runs along and says, oh, my master changed his mind. He wants a bunch of stuff. That was his attitude. Right? It's the rich young ruler's attitude in Luke 18. So it's not just the Old Testament, right? And it's the attitude to Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, verse 10. So no one in the Corinthian church would desire to be in that company, right? And, and, or have a reputation like that. And no one in the modern church would want that either, which is precisely why Paul uses the language. But the stark reality is that it's either one or the other. Either you're generous, faithful, sacrificial, and you do what you're supposed to do, or covetousness is at play to some extent in your life and that's how direct the verse really is see and so paul's very straightforward with them here and he says so i thought it necessary to urge the brother that they would go on ahead to you so they're going to get there before i do and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gifts so the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by any covetousness and we can we can escape the sin then of covetousness by being unselfish and generous it's easy isn't it just be open-handed like the lord is with you and you get to escape it and, and here's the deal, and you know this, our culture will tell you, you know, if you sit back and observe it, if you want to have wealth, the road to wealth is, you know, hoard as much as you can, buy everything you can, put yourself in a position to take advantage, work your way up the ladder no matter what it takes so you have the income that you deserve, cover your actions, of course, and your motives and your greed with a shell of cordiality, of course, you know, the handshake and the exchange of cards and, you know, nice doing business with you. But um, when you have the opportunity to accumulate and secure future prosperity, that's, I mean, if you had to sum it up, I mean, that's the commercials, that's the, that's the way it's modeled in the world, okay? God, however, has a very different plan for you. And it doesn't include hoarding, and it doesn't include taking advantage of anybody, and it does not include selfish actions and motives or greed of any kind. God's plan, as we've seen, includes hard work, and includes planning and saving and investing, and it includes giving some of what you have away in a generous, proportional, sacrificial, faithful manner. And when we do that, beloved, and this we're going to finish with this, verse 6, and this takes us, you know, Paul brings this harsh reality to them, and then he says this is so great, this verse and then the ones to follow, and we don't have time to get into it today, but we'll just read it, and this will be, this will be a good prompt for you for next week. Now this I say, so after he's got through saying all that. We don't want any covetousness. Now this I say, remember this, he says, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So as you're thinking about what you're going to do, and as you're processing all this and getting your finances in line with how the Lord would have you manage them, keep this, and this is so great, this is an axiomatic passage. It just means it, it's a self-evident truth. It doesn't have to be defended. And mark this, the fact that he's talking about money and you can't put anything else in there is amazing to me. It's a self-evident truth. You don't have to defend it. This is how it works. 
And it's all the more remarkable because he's talking about money. He's using an agrarian illustration, of course, but he's talking about money. This is God's plan to take care of his people. And we're going to see this several times, and you saw it already because we read it, but this is, we're going to see this several times in this passage, see? God's plan to take care of his people. And here's the deal. Every farmer knows this principle, and every gardener probably, too. It has to be there in the form of a seed before it can be there in the form of a plant and then later for the harvest. And they're proportional. Plant sparingly, reap sparingly. You just use a few seeds. So in other words, when you figure out what you're going to do, just remember when you just use a little, you're going to get that back. And we're going to see the Lord presses down, shakes it together and overflows it. But plant little, get little, right? Plant generously and harvest back generously. So that's the general axiom. And everybody knows that that's how it works. The harvest is in proportion to the seed that's sown. And beloved, that's not a promise that we will get rich and so we can consume everything God gives us for our own desires. That's not that at all. It's disconnected completely from that. The money we're sowing, beloved, is the money we're giving away, okay? That's the money we're investing in eternity. And there's so many other benefits for it. You're laying up treasure in heaven and that never fades away and it's going to meet you there when you get there and all that, okay? And all he's simply saying is this. And God will return our investment with a dividend. That's how it works, okay? I told the church uh, this morning, of course, except for carrots, you just put three seeds and like 30 carrots, you know, if you'd had a garden, you know how this works. But in general, this is how this works. It's a marvelous thought to think. And the fact that Paul uses this as it relates to how they're supposed to give and he, in the, in the middle of a harsh reality of, hey, you, you, you promised this and you inspired other churches, do what, you're, do what you should do. It's just an amazing thing for us to think about as we, as we really move into our prayer time, and we'll, uh, we'll close right here if you bow with me. Lord, we thank you today for a time to be in your word. We thank you for the blessing that comes from uh, being together. Uh, Father, we know that we should be together, that we should be together all the more as we see the day, that's the day of uh, Christ's rapture and his future return coming. So we don't obey the laws of man as it relates to that. We obey the laws of God. And so we do what you say to do. And that's why we're here. And Father, I pray that you'll bless and continue to bless this meeting together and help us to do the things we should do as a result of having the blessing of being together. Father, I pray as we uh, look at these passages that um, you know where we are. You know our resources. You know our choices. You've known them all along, ever since we were a child in the pattern of our life hasn't escaped your notice. And Father, I pray that as we've grown in our relationship with you, that we've grown in all these other areas as well, in our, in our faith and our trust in you, that our security has always been in you, which helps us to be very generous and open-handed as we do what we should do with some of what you've given us. You've been so good to us. You've blessed us beyond measure. We have uh, more than we need, many times more uh, than we need. And so, Father, I pray that You'll help us to learn in whatever state we are. I, I don't pretend to know where everyone is, Father. I just know what the Word says and, and what, how it applies to me. Father, I pray that you'll uh, be liberal by your Holy Spirit. Help them to understand how it applies to them and begin to bring them their finances if it needs to be in line with what your Word says so that they might have your blessing on their life. They may be able to grow in their faith and then see you do what you, exactly what you said you do, replace what has been given, and then bring blessing on them that uh, they can't hold. Father, as we move out from today and we go into uh, our work world and our school world and our influences we have around us and our neighbors and all the stuff we'll do, Father, I pray that two things will be foremost in our mind, that we uh, love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. Father, as it's so common today in, in uh, virtue signaling that uh, racism needs to be taught of, of, you know, against racism, but if we teach that um, you told us to love our neighbor as ourself and love you with all our heart, of does no harm to his neighbor, so it's fulfillment of the law. Lord, if we are believers and we understand what it means to love our neighbor and the illustration was two different ethnic backgrounds, it's not a hard stretch to figure out we don't have to say anything else. Just help us to be that way. And secondly, Father, help us to take the Great Commission as our own, for it is. You win souls as wise. I pray that we'll be faithful to do just that. It's all of our responsibility. Help us to put aside our fears and our uh, doubts about ourselves and go knowing that the gospel is the answer. I pray that you open doors for us in our spheres of influence and give us fruit from those efforts. Father, take us as we go into our week. 
you're doing these kinds of things and being conformed to the image of your son, being in your word, praising you and reading it and doing what it says on a daily basis. We pray this in the name of Jesus, whom we long to see and all God's people said, amen.